Um, okay, guys. Well, uh, you know what? Let's get uh, let's get started here again. I apologize for the uh, slightly larger number of hiccups this evening than usual. Um, for those who are just joining us, uh, unfortunately, Anna's been uh, uh, delayed at work. Um, uh, we're not quite sure exactly how long yet. She's stuck at Victoria General, so hopefully, uh, <laughs> hopefully, they'll get her patient in bed and get her here soon. Um, for this evening, uh, it's going to be me. This was originally going to be both of us presenting, but uh, it's, uh, you guys are stuck with just me. And uh, as you guys know, we're talking about uh, harm reduction and overdoses and supervised consumption and overdose prevention and, uh, and all, of that sort of, uh, all that sort of world. Um, just, as we, uh, just, as we get, uh, just as we get going here, um, I'm going to introduce Anna because hopefully she'll be able to join us at some point. Um, both Anna and myself are paramedics with BC Emergency Health Services, formerly BC Ambulance Service. Uh, both of us uh, have been uh, paramedics in harm reduction environments or supervised consumption or overdose prevention environments where we've, uh, where we've worked directly in uh, an overdose prevention supervised consumption space. Um, and we're going to talk about what that means a little bit. Uh, Anna is, of course, as you guys know, uh, the Divisional Superintendent for Division 176. Uh, I'm a provincial staff officer with St. John here in the BC Yukon. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a few odds and ends of our, our personal experience that are going to, we might delve into a little bit more detail as we move forward. Uh, it's really important, guys, and I, uh, um, because of some recent, uh, because of some recent changes, uh, policy changes, I have to make it exceptionally clear today. Uh, I am here, and Anna, when she joins us, uh, are here talking from our own personal experience. We're not in any way representing our employer or, or uh, anything we do in our professional lives. This is our, our St. John related experience, and some of our own personal experiences outside of St. John that we're not here as uh, representing any other agency. Um, so, a little bit of an overview about what we're going to be talking about tonight. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, narcotics and opiates. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, addiction and what addiction is and means. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the uh, the opioid epidemic. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you guys have seen this covered in uh, in the news. We're going to talk about harm reduction, why, uh, what it is and why it's important. We're going to talk about uh, narcotic or specifically, uh, well, narcotic and opiate overdoses. And we're going to talk about working in uh, an overdose prevention uh, or, or supervised consumption environment and how that differs uh, quite greatly from uh, a lot of the work that we might uh, that we might think of normally in terms of pre-hospital first aid and healthcare, and we're going to talk a little bit about how St. John's been involved in some of these initiatives as well. Um, so uh, opening up a little bit, guys. Uh, narcotics. What are they? Um, uh, the word narcotic, and you're going to have to pardon me, guys. These the first twenty odd slides here are Anna's slides, so if I'm a little bit unfamiliar with them. Uh, I, it's because I didn't write them. <laughs> um, but the word narcotic comes from the Greek word for stupor, referring to substances that uh, dull the senses and relieve pain. More recently, uh, and narcotics do, if we want to split hairs, technically refer to opium uh, derivatives and opioids or synthetic opiates. Um, often the term narcotic is used in a broader sense uh, to talk about uh, to talk about many, many categories or families of illicit drugs. This is the sort of technical definition. Um, what drugs fall into that opiate family or opioids, both organic and synthetic? Uh, well, uh, codeine, which is one of the ingredients in Tylenol 3s. Um, heroin uh, is a fairly well-known substance that's been used for many, many centuries. Um, morphine, often, uh, often branded as Cadian or MS content, OxyContin. Uh, tramadol, oxycodone, Percocets, oxycontin, hydrocodone, Vicodin, Lortab, meperidine or Demerol, um, hydromorphone, dilated fentanyl, which is very, very uh, well known these days. Fentanyl is a, a very particularly potent, and very strong opiate that has a very strong effect. And methadone, methadone is something that I believe we have a couple slides on that later talking about how methadone opiate antagonist therapy can help people who are suffering from opiate addiction move past that addiction. Um, so how do narcotics work? How do opiates work? Well, cells have, an, and we're gonna do a little crash course in cellular biology here. The way, uh, the way in which 
cells uh, receive signals from chemicals outside of the cell, in the cell wall, or something called receptors. Chemical information from other molecules comes and binds to the receptor on the outside of the cell wall, which then triggers a chemical reaction inside the cell, which then changes the way the cell functions. So it's sort of like having a, a, having a little window. If you imagine the, if you go to gas stations late at night and there's a little window where you can talk to the guy through the gas station, it's kind of like a receptor. You can go out and talk to the guy through the window and then you know whoever, whoever the employee is can go and get you whatever snack food or whatever it is you're looking to get from inside the station, uh, accomplish some actions inside the station and so forth. So uh, you know, receptors, opiate receptors are the gateway between the outside of the cellular world and the inside of the cellular world. Um, molecules bind to the cell wall at the receptor site, which activates the receptor. Um, and, and depending on the type of uh, depending on the type of substance and receptor, they will stay bound for some period of time. Um, so, uh, in terms of natural versus artificial agonists or receptors, agonists mean things that make them do things. So, an agonist, uh, an opiate agonist is uh, something that interacts with and influences opiate receptors on the outside of the cell wall and then causes the cell to do things. Um, the body has opiate receptors or opioid receptors that trigger the brain's reward system and therapeutic effects. So analgesia, uh, a, a sensation of euphoria are, are two of those things. So by using opiates, either organic or synthetic, um, uh, these substances activate the external receptors of the cell walls and cause the body's pain relief uh, functions to be engaged, cause the body's euphoric or emotional centers to be engaged. Um, endorphins are natural agonists of opioid receptors. So if, you, if you're a runner and you get a runner high, a runner's high, or, or you know, that sort of like post-workout high, um, you know, those are to a certain extent um, the effects of, of opioid receptors being activated by your body's own natural and internal systems. Um, narcotics, uh, well, this is, I, um, this definition is a, a smidge off, but uh, synthetic, uh, synthetic narcotics are artificial agonists of opioid receptors. So your body can activate opioid receptors itself. Um, natural chemicals, so uh, opium, for example, uh, to a certain extent, natural heroin that comes from poppy plants, for example, um, are organic. They grow in nature and they can be pro processed and refined to a point where they can be ingested into people and triggered as opiate receptors. And we also now have the scientific capacity or capability of building or completely synthesizing from scratch other opiates as well, or opiate like events. Sometimes we talk about opiate analogs, things that are very similar to opiates. Um, that activate those sensors as well. Receptors, pardon me. Um, so uh, this is maybe a, a more helpful analogy. Um, so uh, narcotics or opiates are the key that activates the receptor site, the lock, that then opens the door and allows the, the external signal from the cell to actually influence the function of the cell itself. Um, I'm going to leave that up for a second for you guys. So um, natural agonists are substances within the body that have evolved to produce a response when they bind to and switch on a receptor. Um, agonist drugs mimic natural agonists within the body binding to receptors to create the same effect, but often with a much more uh, a significant physiological response. So what we're trying to say there, and uh, um, pardon me, I'm going to mute folks as they come unmuted here, just, uh, just to keep the background noise down a bit. Um, what we're saying here is that the, the natural opiates that exist in your body and, and also the natural opiates that exist in the plant world that we have learned to refine and stuff are often much less potent than the synthetic opiates that we can actually, uh, we can actually synthesize in a lab environment. Now, fentanyl being a very, uh, a very good example of that. So uh, everyone's heard of naloxone. I hope everyone's heard of naloxone by this point in time. Um, uh, naloxone, incidentally, is, is, is very often uh, referred to as Narcan. Narcan is the, uh, is the brand name. Naloxone is the generic name. It's the same thing as Tylenol and acetaminophen. Tylenol is a brand name. Acetaminophen is a generic name. Um, 
broadly speaking, we're sourcing naloxone from many different sources these days. And so uh, uh, we're, we're just referring to naloxone because it's not necessarily the brand name Narcan. It's exactly the same stuff. Um, so what does naloxone do? Well, naloxone basically, got, uh, if I can go back here for a second, um, if we look at this red cloud key thing here, the outside, uh, the outside agonist that's binding to the receptor site, causing all these, uh, causing all of these internal effects. One of the internal effects that opiates will have, one of the cellular effects that opiates will have, um, is that they'll help, uh, on a systemic level, to help decrease the body's respiratory drive. This is why we have problems with people overdosing and uh, um, becoming apneic or stopping breathing with higher doses of opiate use or with more potent opiate use. What naloxone does is uh, it's like putting a, a paper clip into that lock and breaking it off so it actually blocks the key itself, the agonist, from binding to that receptor site instead. Um, naloxone only works if there are, uh, are there opiates and narcotics uh, present in the body, so uh, naloxone will only work um, to actually block specific opiates from binding to opiate receptor sites. It doesn't block any other. Uh, it doesn't block any other chemicals or any other neurotransmitters from binding to receptor sites. It blocks specifically and only opiates. Um, while narcotics are agonists, so narcotics will come in and bind to a receptor site and trigger an internal action. The difference with naloxone is naloxone comes and binds to that receptor site, doesn't cause any kind of cellular action, and prevents other, uh, other agonists from binding to the same site. So it basically shuts down that cell or that system's capacity to receive opiate agonist information or neurotransmitters and, uh, um, and act accordingly. So uh, this is maybe a good example. And again, I apologize, guys. I'm seeing a lot of these slides for the first time myself. So you guys bear with me for a sec here. But um, antagonists uh, block access to a receptor from natural agonists. So they're sometimes called blockers. Opiate blockers is not, uh, not a term I hear commonly, but it certainly fits. Um, antagonists work with binding to a cell's receptor and blocking access to the receptor. So as you can see, the orange antagonist has blocked the receptor site, preventing the red agonist from accessing that site and triggering a response. Um, and you know, different types of uh, different types of uh, agonists, you know, or we talk about opiate agonists because that's what we're talking about today, will have different effects on cells. Uh, pardon me, I'm just going to mute one more person here. Um, will have different effects on, uh, on cells. Um, in the case of opiates, some of the effects that we have or the effects that we see are we see um, analgesia, pain management, we see decrease in respiratory drive, which is a problem, which is problematic, um, among other things. We see uh, a sense of euphoria or, or modulation of brain chemistry for, to provide a sense of euphoria to the, uh, to the person uh, under the effects of the substance. So uh, certain addictive drugs uh, activate reward pathways in the brain and release neurotransmitters in excessive amounts. So, so uh, um, neurotransmitters like dopamine are responsible for um, uh, reward and motivation, for example. Um, one person, I, I, I actually know the same person who uh, who had this conversation with Anna. Uh, but one one of our uh, one of our regular clients once described uh, their initial experiences with opiate use as like getting a hug from God, um, which is uh, I have no personal experience with opiates uh, at all, uh, either in a medical or personal capacity. Um, but, uh, but we thought it was a very, very good, uh, a very, very good, maybe emotionally charged descriptor of what that sense of euphoria, uh, is like. And unfortunately, because, uh, the pathways that lead to addiction can be very, very complex and some of them are chemical and some of them are psychological dependence and, and there's a lot of interplay between those and I'm not an addictions expert. So I apologize if I'm getting any of this a little bit wrong. Um, but to, by triggering those reward pathways, people do eventually become uh, more uh, more dependent or more prone to need the substances that they're uh, that they're using to activate those dopamine pathways, and they become uh, initially or progressively, pardon me, more and more dependent uh, on having those substances available to them. Um, there are a lot of roles that can, or a lot of factors, pardon me, that can play a role in substance use. Um, 
things that can cause people to turn to substance use and things that can cause people to become um, dependent on substances. Uh, you know, the, the, the low hanging fruit, the obvious ones that we talk about a lot uh, and hear talked about a lot by addictions experts are mental illness. Um, we unfortunately live in, a, in a, a, a world right now where we don't have great supports for people suffering from uh, moderate to severe mental illness. And if you're uh, unfortunate enough to have one of those severe mental illnesses, um, in many cases, or not in, well, in a lot of cases, many cases, um, a lot of people find it, um, find that they can't get the support that they need from the healthcare system and will end up self-medicating with, uh, I just let someone else in. Uh, will find themselves self-medicating with either um, street drugs or other drugs that they have access to. Um, childhood trauma uh, and sexual abuse and personal tragedy, all these traumatic mechanisms. We talk a lot about uh, uh, looking at substance use disorders and addiction through a, a trauma-informed lens. And what that means is we're trying to recognize that the, the pain and suffering that people have gone through in the past uh, will directly impact how uh, um, or can directly impact how prone they may be to turning towards substance use as, as a way to manage or cope with that trauma. Um, environment, home and community. So people who are experiencing prejudice or marginalization, uh, uh, which in, all, in many, many ways are forms of trauma, um, may, in a lot of cases, use substances to cope with the feelings of trauma or social isolation as a result of that. That's part of the reason that we see people who are in marginalized groups, um, who are in uh, ethnic minority groups, uh, may sometimes, in some situations, be more prone, uh, I shouldn't say ethnic minority groups, but people who are in marginalized ethnic minority groups is maybe a more appropriate way to, to, to put that, um, maybe more prone or overrepresented in, uh, in, in groups that experience addiction. Um, often people are searching for a release of numbing or physical or mental pain, and this goes back to people who are not having their, their needs met by uh, by the, the existing healthcare system, whether it's the existing physical healthcare system or the existing psychiatric and mental healthcare system. Um, please keep this stuff in mind when you're working with these populations that a lot of, uh, a lot of these factors come into play with, uh, a lot of these factors come into play with folks and that it's, it's very rare to non-existent, I would say, to, to meet individuals who use substances for only one reason or have developed addiction because of only one cause. Almost always uh, addiction and substance use uh, stem from multifactorial uh, backgrounds, um, often including many or all of these, uh, many or all of these factors. Um, so uh, the opioid epidemic, I think everyone's, uh, everyone's heard of the opioid epidemic. Uh, for those of you who, who might not be in BC, um, <clears throat> uh, we've been particularly hard hit out here on the West Coast. Uh, I know we have a bunch of people visiting us or joining us from uh, Ontario this evening. Um, in 2016, BC's provincial health officer declared a public health emergency after a significant uh, increase in drug-related overdoses and deaths. We're gonna look at some numbers in just a second about this. But, um, um, what we saw is, uh, if you guys have a look at this chart, I didn't realize Anna had included this table because I've included this table in one of my slides later. Um, but uh, what we've seen is, is a drastic, drastic uptick in, uh, in uh, deaths from illicit drug toxicity. And in, this is a coroner service report uh, table. And we have uh, at the very end of this presentation, there'll be uh, um, some slides with references and citations and stuff to give you links to the stuff. But, um, you know, in, in 2010, we saw in British Columbia 211 uh, deaths secondary to uh, uh, illicit drugs. And illicit in this context is talking about really anything that was procured, I believe, uh, anything that was procured outside of, of normal sort of pharmaceutical or healthcare environments. Um, 2011 saw 295, 2012 saw 270. Fast forward to 2018, 1,546 
um, that's a pretty uh, a pretty steep increase. 2017, 1,495. And as you guys can see, you know that 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 number sort of stays steady for 2010, 11, 12. Starts to go up a little bit. 2012, 2013, 2014. And then really takes off 2015 and into 2016 was when we really started to see uh, see the number of deaths uh, really really increase increase quite drastically. We only have numbers for uh, um, or up until the month of June of this year. The July numbers have not come out for 2020 yet. Uh, I was looking just a few hours ago and they they, they haven't been released by the coroner's office yet. Um, but already we've had in British Columbia 728 people die. Uh, secondary to illicit drug use uh, just in this calendar year. Uh, that's not a small number. And I anticipate, if you see, um, in 2018 to 2019, there was a big decrease from 1,546 down uh, to 981. And that's partially or largely the result of some pretty incredible public health initiatives um, that were implemented that we're going to talk about later on. And again, you'll see that we're already in 2020 almost at a number that's approximately equal to the total number of deaths in all of 2019. And we're going to talk about some of the reasons for that as well after this later on. Um, so from 2016 to 2019, uh, a total, and this is a Canadian statistic, this is nationwide, 15,393 people died in Canada from, from opioid overdoses. Um, 2019 across six provinces. I'm not, I can't speak too much to, to the six province uh, commentary here. Again, I'm sorry, these aren't my slides. I'm, I'm sort of presenting for Anna while she's uh, stuck at work right now. Um, but suggesting that, you know, 68% of, uh, of these deaths involve non-pharmaceutical opioids. 21% of the deaths uh, involved only pharmaceutical opioids. So people who, uh, people who were, uh, for whatever reason, uh, using prescription drugs in a way that resulted in their death. Um, and 9%, about 1 in 10 deaths, involved a combination of both pharmaceutical and non-pharmaceutical opioids. I'm not clear if this, if these statistics uh, for pharmaceutical versus non-pharmaceutical opioids include legally obtained by prescription or not. I'm not clear on the delineation there. And again, I'm sorry, I can't speak to that uh, in greater detail. Um, so in terms of people often ask about this, people want to talk about, you know, well, how bad is that compared to other, uh, compared to other causes of death? And this is, uh, this is maybe a good chart to look at to help indicate that. So the, the solid line here, and, uh, I don't think I have an easy way to wave my pointer around because I'm just doing this on one computer right now, um, or one screen. Um, but that solid line that goes way, way, way up to the top of the graph there, that's the number of illicit drug deaths. Uh, the little dotted line is the number of suicide deaths. Um, the dashed line below that is motor vehicle incidents. Uh, MVIs seem to hover at about 300 deaths per year. For every one person that is killed in a car crash every year in British Columbia, we are currently seeing about th uh, three to five times that many people. So for every one person, there's between three and five people um, every one person that's killed by a, a motor vehicle incident, uh, uh, three to five people are killed by opiate overdoses. And then we see, uh, we see homicide and prescription drug deaths down at the bottom. <clears throat> so, um, a, a few more statistics in Canada in 2019, more people died of overdoses than homicides, motor vehicle incidents, and suicides combined. Uh, I, uh, I don't have this number in front of me, but I, I do recall reading earlier today um, that overdose by opioid uh, is the leading cause of death for people under the age of 50. Um, I, I don't have that citation handy right now, I'm sorry, but uh, it certainly doesn't surprise me and doesn't seem unrealistic. 56.6% um, of deaths in 2019 were in private residences. I believe uh, that number is actually down from the year before. It used to be closer to 70%. Um, where people are going into private residences using on their own uh, uh, without anyone there to help them in the event of an overdose. Um, males age 19 to 49 have the highest rate of death following opiate overdose. Uh, 
in terms of why that particular demographic is particularly affected, I, I couldn't tell you, unfortunately. Um, I, I have a number of suspicions, but I, I don't have anything solid that's backed up by data, so I'm not gonna speak to, to, to too much about that. Um, and there are no official statistics available, and this is, this is a, a big take home, there are no official statistics available on how many people are left with disability from hypoxic brain injuries or anoxic brain injuries. So how many people survive their overdose, uh, their overdose event, and in some cases, multiple overdose events, but are left, uh, but are left as neurologically uh, uh, disabled or crippled um, as a result of those, uh, of those events. And we don't, have, uh, we don't have great numbers on that, unfortunately. Um, so why do we have an opioid epidemic? Well, uh, narcotics can be highly addictive. Opioids can be highly addictive. Um, for, for several decades, uh, narcotics were liberally distributed for all kinds of pain. And this is, uh, there, there's a whole bunch of reasons uh, that we don't have time to really go down the rabbit hole on today, unfortunately, um, where opioids were, were very, very widely prescribed by physicians, by the healthcare system in North America for pain management uh, of everything to, from back pain to post-operative recovery to, uh, to sort of anything else um, where people were feeling pain or discomfort. Um, in 2018, one in eight people were prescribed opioids, uh, totaling 4.6 million Canadians. That's a lot of Canadians. Oh, uh, we have an Anna joining us. Maddie, come here. No. Maddie, the dog, is also joining us, but she doesn't want to appear on camera right now. Uh, I'm like one slide away from finishing your slides, so I'm just going to keep going. That's okay. I'm getting a thumbs up. I'll let you log on. If, if, if I like you enough, I'll let you, I'll let you through the waiting room. Um, um, yeah, so in 2018, 4.6 million Canadians uh, um, were prescribed opioids. That's a lot of people. That's a lot of people. Um, I'm seeing a couple of questions here from Thomas Finn. Thomas, I'm going to come back to your questions uh, later on just because I'm still, until Anna gets in here, I'm still sort of running this, uh, running this on my own right now. Um, so. Why do we have an overdose epidemic? Well, we have a prescription epidemic, which has increased opiate use, uh, and in many cases, um, increased people's exposure to opiates. In many cases, people have not been uh, appropriately managed by the healthcare system with their opiate use. Either they haven't had, uh, haven't had good oversight by physicians, or they've just been prescribed their opiates and sort of left their own devices. Um, more prevalent exposure to narcotics. I'm not quite sure what Anna's trying to get out there. Um, people will uh, people will get cut off and turn to other sources for their medication. So some people might be prescribed opiates, and then uh, for whatever reason, either the doctor becomes concerned or they just fail to go and renew a prescription or or other reasons, um, might have a sudden discontinuation of their prescription medication that. Uh, that uh, results in them turning to alternate sources. Uh, of course, as you guys, uh, I'm sure, are all aware, um, if someone has become dependent on opioids and then suddenly stops them, they can go through really significant withdrawal symptoms. And uh, unfortunately, uh, going cold turkey, as it were, off opiates or opioids um, can be a very, very difficult thing. And so if people lose access to their, uh, lose access to their prescription opioids, they'll often turn to other sources uh, that can result in, in accessing, uh, accessing supplies like street drug supplies of drugs. Um, there's often a lot of other underlying factors as well. There's a lot of, uh, a lot of stuff that goes into the history of trauma, um, self-medication, all these sorts of things that we talked a little bit about earlier. Um, why is there an overdose epidemic? Well, um, there are more potent drugs on the street. Uh, for a whole bunch of reasons, uh, a whole bunch of reasons, we've seen an increase in the the production of hyperpotent opiate uh, medications, things like fentanyl, carfentanil. Uh, there's some some analogs called W18. All these other uh, fairly exotic, um, fairly exotic uh, opiate drugs. But uh, what unfortunately a, a lot of people uh, um, what unfortunately a lot of people have found, a lot of people who are not necessarily nice people or good people have found is that it's not actually very difficult at all um, to synthesize very potent opiates. And for a very small, previously, pr prior to the 
1990s, 2000s, um, to, to get access to opiates. Um, people would be importing, uh, you know, large quantities of heroin from places like Afghanistan and, and China and other parts of the world where, where these crops could be grown, the, the opium, opiate opioids could be harvested from poppy seeds and from other organic sources and imported wholesale into Canada. Um, and of course, that's a very large scale industrial production uh, or large scale industrial enterprise. Um, you know, the South American drug trade and the import of uh, cocaine from South America is well portrayed in the media as well. Um, uh, but unfortunately, what a, 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 a lot of uh, more industrious folks have realized in the last uh, decade or so is that for a few thousand dollars, you can produce fentanyl uh, without too much, too much difficulty, unfortunately. Um, and fentanyl, of course, is a lot more potent than, than uh, heroin, a lot more potent than a lot of the other opiates. And if it's not mixed appropriately, you can have very, very high, inadvertently, uh, frequently have very, very high doses of fentanyl in uh, mixed in with uh, what would otherwise be uh, a predictable, uh, a predictable quantity of drugs. So you have, you think that you're getting uh, one particular unit of heroin, and you're actually getting something that's ten or a hundred times more potent than that with the fentanyl. Um, cheap, potent, and hard to dose uh, drugs, uh, and hard to dose is uh, is uh, important here because it can be very difficult to ascertain exactly how much of a substance if we don't have a known purity of substance. Or concentration of substance, um, it can be very difficult to predict uh, how those substances are going to, uh, how much of that substance you're going to be ingesting. Um, and all of that means that we're, we see people, unfortunately, inadvertently overusing substances and inadvertently using significantly more potent substances than they intended to, um, and then having an overdose event and then dying or having other, uh, other consequences from that. So uh, what have we done to respond to the opioid epidemic, um, the overdose epidemic? Well, here in British Columbia, we've, we've done a lot. Um, and again, I'm not sure how much of this translates to our colleagues back out east. Um, um, you know, we've, we've uh, provided take-home naloxone programs. The BC Centre for Disease Control has provided a take-home naloxone program. Uh, where they've provided naloxone kits and training for people so that if people are going to be using uh, using substances, and I should clarify as well, pardon me, we are also seeing a lot of non, what are, what people believe or are trying to purchase as non-opiate substances also containing high potency opiates as well. So we see a lot of people who are trying to purchase um, either stimulants, uh, crystal meth, cocaine, uh, other substances that have fentanyl mixed into them. And the reason that fentanyl is mixed in is, again, a, a, a very complex set of reasons, but generally speaking, it's to try and increase the potency of the drugs that are being sold, and it's not always being mixed in, not always being mixed in, in uh, a very, uh, very detail-oriented way, unfortunately. So, um, so in terms of our response, um, we have more naloxone available. We have take-home programs. We have access to training. We have access to online training. We have access to peer training. Um, and we've seen a, a large number of groups uh, rise up to the challenge of providing that training to the general public, St. John included. Um, if you want to do a naloxone administration course, St. John is one of the uh, one of the many ways or many groups that you can access uh, to, to take that training. You can also do online training at towardtheheart.ca um spelled just like it sounds um where you can go and learn how to administer naloxone online i believe it's like a 20 or 30 minute course or something like that i haven't looked at it for a little while but um in 2017 uh we implemented british columbia imprint implemented um, no i think it was canada actually pardon me i believe it was canada implemented or enacted the good samaritan drug overdose act um what that does is it provides legal protection for people calling 911 during an overdose uh, previous to the Good Samaritan Drug Overdose Act, uh, there were incidences of people uh, not phoning 911 uh, when someone overdosed because everyone at the site had been in possession and using drugs. And the people who had not overdosed uh, were very worried, uh, and, and in many cases, in some cases rightfully so, that they might be arrested for possession. Uh, of illicit substances as well. So the Good Samaritan Drug Overdose Act uh, provided legal protection for people calling 911 during an overdose. 
says that if you're calling 911 for an overdose, you cannot be prosecuted for possession of a controlled substance when you seek support. Um, and uh, the, the idea or the goal of this is to reduce fear of prosecution if police attend a call for help. Um, very often police will attend because of the nature of these events. Very often police will attend uh, uh, overdose events. Less so these days. For a while it was, uh, um, for a while it was it was a very very common place thing to have police attend as well and we're seeing those numbers go down and uh, guys asking questions in the group chat i do see your questions coming up my plan is at the end of this to basically just scroll back to the top and start scrolling through uh scrolling through your questions i'm not ignoring you <clears throat> um in uh, in response to the opioid epidemic so what else has bc done well here in british columbia we've had uh, overdose prevention sites and supervised consumption sites uh, what's the difference between those? Well, overdose prevention sites are, uh, are sites where people can come to use substances under the supervision of some form of healthcare professional or person who can help resuscitate you if you overdose. So many overdose prevention sites have someone who's just taken a naloxone course and may not have any formal healthcare qualifications or skills. Uh, some overdose prevention sites are staffed by paramedics. Um, St. John, uh, here in Victoria had quite a few of our off-duty paramedics and uh, a couple of EMRs helped staff one of uh, British Columbia's first uh, overdose prevention sites here in, here in Victoria back in 2016 through to 2018, I guess, uh, when the pod closed and talk about that. Um, supervised consumption sites are, uh, are a little bit, uh, if for, for lack of a better phrase, a little bit beefier. They provide additional services. So a, a supervised consumption site will provide uh, medically supervised uh, consumption. So you can come in, bring your own drugs with you, come in to use a supervised consumption site with a qualified healthcare professional uh, on site to resuscitate you if you overdose. But supervised consumption sites will, uh, and you can do that without being prosecuted for drug possession. Um, but, uh, but you will also have access to uh, counseling access to det detox and rehab, access to uh, social workers who can help with housing needs, um, things like that that are particularly uh, important to marginalized and street level populations or street involved populations. There's a whole bunch of legal framework involved that I'm not an expert on um, in, in terms of supervised consumption sites and how they operate. Um, they do have an exemption under section 56.1 of the Controlled Drugs, Drugs and Substances Act uh, so these are things that are, are endorsed specifically by Health Canada and by uh, um, by the federal government. But in terms of the exact legal infrastructure, I'm sorry, I'm not a subject matter expert that can talk uh, at any degree of length on that. Um, overdose prevention sites. Oh, I didn't realize this slide was coming up next. <laughs> overdose prevention sites are uh, uh, were they are still a community response to the opioid or to the overdose epidemic and the declared health emergency. They don't require a federal exemption. Uh, they they do run uh, they run on an order from the Minister of Health, uh, the provincial Minister of Health, which requires uh, an overdose prevention site uh, to be available throughout the, throughout the province. Um, prior to uh, prior to that ministerial order, there were a few uh, sort of uh, rebel sites that I believe had started up a little bit earlier than that. Um, overdose prevention sites uh, are often. Uh, pop-up sites, tents in parks, converted shipping containers, et cetera. The pod that we're gonna talk about in, uh, in a second is, is an example of the latter. Um, they're often peer initiated or staffed, so they're often run by, uh, by street level outreach groups, poverty outreach groups, substance use and substance addiction outreach groups. Um, so some overdose prevention sites allow methods of consumption, they're prohibited at SCSs. Uh, notable examples of that are, uh, are smoking right now. Um, there's no supervised consumption site. Uh, ooh, there might be no, actually, I'm not sure. Um, but certainly some supervised consumption sites don't allow smoking of substances, which is a very common way to ingest opiates. And that's a problem because we also see people frequently uh, overdose at SCSs. Um, some overdose prevention sites have lower barriers and are more accessible than SCSs, some are not. Um, but there, there, there certainly is the capacity to have a lower regulatory barrier for people to access sites in terms of, of um, substance use, in terms of maybe their uh, complex behavioral issues that make, uh, make clients 
unsuitable to access uh, supervised consumption sites, there might be overdose prevention sites that, that they can access instead. <clears throat> Um, so one of the first uh, one of the first uh, overdose prevention sites in Victoria was the Pod. Uh, technically, Pod stood for the Place of Dignity, uh, which was uh, turned into a little bit of a running joke with the clientele because uh, um, a lot of people didn't see a lot of. Uh, it provided dignity in a, in an enclosed space, and it provided dignity for for people to not have to use on the street. But it was always a running joke with the clientele who were in that space um, and, and using it as well. Um, so the pod was a shipping container, literally a modified shipping container. Um, if you've seen shipping containers that are sort of turned into construction site offices, uh, it was basically one of those um, that was placed in the parking lot uh, at uh, Our Place Society between December of 2016 and July of 2018. And uh, um, allowed up to initially two and then three and then six uh, uh, six people to come in and use substances in a uh, in a supervised supervised place where they would uh, receive paramedic level care uh, in the event that they overdosed and uh, also be able to come in and access things like wound care um, and, and, and things like that uh, St. John uh, played a, a fairly significant unofficial role in uh, in helping staff and supply the pod for, for a large part of the time that it operated. Um, I think most of the time that it was up and running, more than 50% of the staff were, were uh, St. John members here in Victoria. Um, and they were paid staff working at this space, but uh, because of the relationship St. John had uh, with our place society from the street clinics uh, that we've been running there for a number of years, uh, we had a good relationship with them. We were able to help provide them with some expertise and also some supplies for wound care supplies and, uh, and things like that to be able to uh, to be able to help the place uh, stay up and running. So um, what's turned, and this is the end of Anna's slides now and uh, the beginning of mine. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what's different in terms of managing substance use and managing people with substance use and managing medical emergencies um, between an SCS and over to, so a supervised consumption site, an overdose prevention site, a harm reduction site, sort of a harm reduction site, sort of a broader umbrella term to, to cover all of these, um, and maybe what we're used to in terms of normal pre-hospital healthcare um, in terms of overdoses or street overdoses or private residence overdoses or whatever. So um, we're going to talk a little bit about language, open drug use, harm reduction equipment, uh, bystander involvement, uh, proximity, use and overdose, and uh, and what respect means and why that's important um, to a lot of folks. The respect is one of my favorite slides here, I think. So in terms of language, um, one of the things that's uh, quite evident uh, uh, fairly quickly when you start working in a supervised consumption site is that uh, um, A, there's a very distinct dialect um, that, that belongs to or is used by um, substance using populations, particularly street level substance using populations. Um, that dialect varies regionally. A, a couple times in previous versions of this presentation, we've, we've provided sort of a glossary of this word means this, and this word, mean, this word means this. And uh, after getting a little bit more experience, especially in other geographical parts of British Columbia, it's become quite apparent that, that a lot of that terminology is very regionally specific. Um, uh, you know, some examples of street language are, uh, um, you know, down refers to, generally speaking, uh, opiates, but any kind of sedatives, so benzos, benzodiazepines would be considered down. Opium, heroin, fentanyl, oxycontin, these are all things that are down. And there's not necessarily a lot of distinction between those different specific drugs. They're just all down. Um, um, you know, uh, one that uh, one one that still gets me is that uh, um, pants, like the, the garment that one would wear on their lower limbs, um, it is a, a street term for, for opiates because it's down, it's below the belt. Um, that I still, uh, it just cracks me up a little bit that that's a, that's a piece of local vernacular that's developed. Um, profanity is fairly common and not a sign of disrespect. So it's important to, to recognize when you're working in these spaces or working in these environments that, um, 
that uh, the, the use of profanity is, is very common and is not generally speaking in and of itself um, a, a mark of, of either disrespect or, or discordiality, for, for lack of a better word. Um, something I did learn myself, and, and I think Anna and probably I think Ross Nichols has joined us uh, in this talk as well, would, would probably uh, agree with me on is that if you're working in one of these spaces and you don't know what a word means, people are normally very, very happy to just answer questions. If you're not sure what something means, just ask. And there'll probably be a few cuss words involved, but you'll also probably get an explanation. So if, you, if someone's talking about side and you don't know what side means, ask them and someone will say, oh, that, that means expletive, expletive, expletive meth. Um, uh, and, and then you'll learn that, that side means meth. Um, so other things that are, they're a bit different working inside a supervised consumption site. Um, uh, the, certainly one of the things that took me the, the most time to get used to when I first started working in, uh, in an overdose prevention site was being in and around open drug use. Um, by nature of what the sites are, consumption is usually in the open. People will come in and try to smoke substances inside OPSs and SCSs and other harm reduction sites. And that's unfortunate um, because a lot of these sites, they're not geared for smoking because of the off-gassing of the substances and they don't want uh, the staff to be affected by the substances that are being smoked. Um, but people want a safe place to use their drugs where they won't be hassled by the police and where they'll be safe if they're uh, if they overdose, there'll be someone to care for them. Um, so people will come in and try to conceal the fact that they're smoking. But other than that, generally speaking, uh, consumption is pretty open. This is the purpose uh, of the site. Um, social and bystander involvement has a bit of a different dynamic than street or private residence environments. Um, when uh, when providers respond to uh, overdose emergencies at private residences, at parties, at social events, and things like that. Um, you know, very often there's some degree of, uh, of uh, what's the right word to put this? Um, depending on where you're going, there can often be a degree of, of, of you know, uh, someone who tried to conceal their substance use and snuck off to a bathroom to uh, snort a line of cocaine or to use some other substances and then had an overdose event. Um, or was somewhere, you know, in, in a backyard or around the back of the building having a smoke by themselves or something like that. Um, yeah, certainly in supervised consumption overdose prevention sites, uh, bystander involvement has a very different uh, a very different flavor, if you will, to it. Um, everyone who is there is there for the express purpose of using illicit substances. Um, very often people are there with their friends or colleagues or people that they're friendly with. Um, it, it's important to remember that, that that social dynamic still exists, even in the context of someone having a medical emergency. People become very, very agitated and worried and, uh, about their friends. Um, people who are very, very agitated and worried about their friends may also be high on substances at the time. Um, and that can lead to some very agitated and potentially escalated uh, interactions at times where you're trying to provide care to one person who's just had an overdose event in front of you five feet away and their best friend or close colleague or romantic partner is five feet on the other side of them, um, absolutely losing their mind or or maybe just a complete stranger who's also interjecting uh, with advice on how you should be managing that overdose. So it can be a very, very charged environment at times. Um, it's important to remember, and this is something again, that these harm reduction sites exist for the express purpose of providing a safe space for people to use uh, illicit substances that they might be at risk of overdosing from. Um, and it can be a real change in gears for, for pre-hospital healthcare professionals to differentiate between use, overuse, and overdose, and how and what you should do to respond to each of those things. Um, someone who uses opiates becomes lethargic, has becomes drowsy, has decreased but still effective respirations, and doesn't really respond to you that well, um, for, for, you know, 5, 10, 15, 20, 30 minutes, that person's probably getting the intended use out of their opiates uh, versus, uh, um, versus uh, having an overdose event. 
Um, overuse is certainly a thing that uh, certainly a thing that we see where someone is not having an overdose event. And there are some there are some agencies that have actually stratified overdoses to recognize partial overdoses or mini overdoses where someone's used a little bit uh, a little bit too much substance to be able to be safe on their own or to, to cause adverse reactions, but not enough to require a full resuscitation. We're going to talk a little bit about more of that in another slide or two. Um, and then full on classic overdoses where someone uh, uses a, an opiate of very high potency, um, very rapidly becomes apneic, collapses unconscious, is unrousable, um, can't be stimulated to breathe with pain stimuli and requires assisted ventilation and naloxone therapy as well. Um, so all of those things, those three things are very different things and it can be very difficult, especially for folks who are new to this environment, to recognize differences and you know where does expected use, overuse, and overdose, where are the boundaries between those things and how do you react appropriately uh, without, uh, without, uh, without overreacting? Because if you overreact and, and stick everyone who, has, who uses opiates with naloxone, nobody will come to use the site anymore and that's a problem. Um, and if you underreact to overdoses, that's also obviously a problem. So trying to recognize the difference between those things uh, can be very, uh, very challenging for newcomers uh, in the pre-hospital healthcare profession. Um, last, and this is also something that took for myself quite a bit of, uh, quite a bit of work to, um, or quite a bit of time to get used to, um, is that your proximity to use, overuse, and overdose is greatly diminished. So in a, in a street environment, either running a street clinic for St. John Ambulance or working as a, a pre-hospital paramedic in, in whatever city or environment you might be in, um, you know, very often uh, the call for help comes several minutes, many minutes, two, five, ten minutes after an overdose event. So someone has collapsed, someone else has recognized that this person is in distress, and then either run outside or run to a healthcare professional to ask for help or run to staff at, at a shelter site to ask for help. And that staff has then come to get the first aid person or the paramedic or whoever, who's then come and, and begun providing help for, for this person. Um, so there's a, you know, there's a significant time delay in that, whereas in a supervised consumption site, um, you, you'll very often be sitting five feet away from someone who is actively using substances and injecting uh, injecting substances into themselves, or smoking, if, even though they're not supposed to, but or, or smoking or whatever, um, and that that decrease in distance is is a very very profound change in um, in how much time you have to mentally prepare yourself for what's coming. Certainly, when we're responding to events. You know, uh, as one example, you're at your first aid tent, someone runs up to the first aid tent and says, help, help, someone overdosed in a bathroom just on the other side of that building. You have 60, 90, 120 seconds to grab your equipment, grab your kit, grab your oxygen, find your partner, walk across, uh, walk across 100 meters or whatever, 50 meters to find this person who may have suffered an overdose. And then in a harm reduction environment, that goes down to zero seconds. You're actually the first person there watching this happen. Um, and that can that certainly changes the dynamic in terms of what you do for gear preparation, what you're ready to do immediately, uh, and, and, and so on and so forth, and, and what your resting state of awareness or alertness about your environment can be. Um, I want to talk a little bit about respect, because this is something that I think applies to a lot of people in a lot of both pre-hospital and in-hospital environments. Um, it's important. And, Respect is very often a big deal for street populations because uh, folks who are marginalized, folks who are living on the street, often don't get a lot of respect from the general public, from the rest of society. And it's important to recognize that respect means a lot of different things to different people. And uh, it, it's very often a core value for marginalized folks. Uh, uh, it's very often a thing, uh, you know, you could probably sum this up or, or paraphrase it is if you're not going to give me anything at all, at least give me a bit of respect. Or if you're going to give me anything, at least give me a bit of respect. But it's important to understand that your concept of respect as a, uh, um, as a healthcare professional, as a, uh, a, a, you know, middle or upper class individual who's here, uh, upper, 
middle or upper socioeconomic bracket individual who's here providing help in a healthcare setting. Um, your concepts of respect might be very different than someone else's. And so the things that you're doing to provide respect to other people um, might not be as obvious as you think they are, or the way that you're saying things or phrasing things might not necessarily be perceived as respectful to others. And similarly, things that you don't intend as being disrespectful um, might be perceived by other people as being disrespectful. And it's important to try and tailor your response. Remember that you're there to try and help people. You're not there to, to receive respect or gratitude or, or anything else from others. And so those are all nice things. But uh, you might need to tailor your concepts of, of what respect is uh, and recognize when other people are trying to show you respect uh, in their own way that doesn't necessarily jive with yours. Um, I've found my own personal experience is that introducing yourself and explaining your role. Hi, my name's Nick. I'm a paramedic. My job is to try and help you today, okay? Um, that can go a really long way in really, um, really helping uh, us set expectations early. Um, and being professional and being clear and being patient. Uh, a lot of people, uh, a lot of people who are using harm reduction sites suffer from mental illness. A lot of people who are using harm reduction sites uh, have already used their substances are and are uh, and are high or uh, altered in some way, shape, or form. Um, and so being clear and being patient uh, are, are two really, really important things. And always please be professional, but be clear and be patient. In terms of uh, in terms of what your uh, um, if it takes someone an extra few minutes to get themselves together, please don't be the impatient person. Well, look, you know, I need you to hurry up and figure this out because I, I have to go for lunch. You know, take take your time, sit down, have a conversation with people if you can. Right. Um. Uh, the obligatory COVID PPE slide here. Um. COVID has really mucked up a lot of overdose response, everything. We're going to talk a little bit about that in a sec. One of the things that it's done is, is uh, um, you know, PPE obviously takes time to put on, especially gowns, uh, face shields, gloves, masks, all that stuff. Um, overdose management, and specifically the placement of oropharyngeal and nasopharyngeal airways and bag valve mask ventilation, is inherently an aerosol generating medical procedure, an AGMP. Um, don't cut corners. This is one of those things where um, unfortunately doing things um, doing things a bit more slower and methodically may actually have some not great outcomes for your patients. Hopefully not. Hopefully we're only adding a few seconds here and there. But do make sure that you're being safe first wearing your proper PPE, whatever that is for your for your appropriate agency. Um, but do do recognize that uh, um, do recognize that by working in overdose, you're going to be engaging in an aerosol generating procedure. Um, so that's all the stuff that's different in harm reduction sites. I'm just going to use harm reduction from now on because it's a good catch all. So what's the same in harm reduction sites? What's what's the same as all the other stuff? Well, or as all the other places we do pre-hospital healthcare. Um, the ABCs, the biology and uh, medical emergencies and sugars are all the same. So airway breathing and circulation. Airway breathing and circulation, airway breathing and circulation. Um, ABCs are still the same, right? People need an airway first, they need breathing second, they need circulation third. Please critically intervene if any of those things are not functioning or are operating the way they should. Uh, it's important to recognize though that airway and breathing can be, uh, can be affected in some unusual ways by opiates, and the brain can be affected in some unusual ways by opiates, and that staging your interventions um, might be appropriate depending on the presentation of your patient. So, um, you know, in, in a patient, if I find someone who is, uh, you know, on the street and maybe suffering from a neurological event or something like that, um, I, might move, uh, I might move from a voice uh, straight to pain uh, and straight to placing an airway in terms of airway management or doing a jaw thrust and then placing an airway. Um, someone who's using opiates uh, may be rousable with a loud shout. And so they may actually have, uh, uh, they may actually have a non-patent airway secondary to their opiate use. They may be apneic because of that patent airway. So their airway is closed. They've become centrally cyanosed. They're not breathing. 
And if you shout at them really, really loud, they jump up and start breathing again and maintain their own airway, right? Um, similarly, uh, what I refer to here is haptic, uh, haptic intervention. So literally just tapping or shaking a person. Um, again, things that don't necessarily require uh, the administration of a pain stimulus, um, but can still be very, very effective at managing people or, or getting people from a, a, an haptic state. Uh, or a non-patent airway state back into guarding their own airway. Um, similarly, vestibular uh, vestibular stimulation is, uh, I've, I've put this in here myself as well. This is, incidentally, this voice haptic vestibular pain, this is my own personal experience I'm, I'm trying to, to qualify here. Um, but I can't count the number of times that I've found someone who's apparently overdosed uh, on opiates to some extent. They haven't responded to voice stimulation. They haven't responded to tapping or shaking them. And so now I have to try and get them to a place where I can manage them a little bit more effectively. And sometimes they won't even have responded to pain stimuli as well. You know, we don't do sternal rubs anymore. Those are gone, those are out. Um, but uh, I hear ice water in the ear from Mike. Uh, funny story, remind me about that later. Um, but, um, uh, but people might not respond to pain stimuli. And so we grab them by their arms, their legs, their jacket, their belt, whatever, to try and drag them or move them to a more open place where we can provide more, more resuscitation to them. Um, very often, uh, this has happened to me at least five or six times where people have been inside uh, bathroom stalls sitting on a toilet, use substances and sort of slump to collapse off to one side. And uh, you know, you grab them to go and move them. And the actual change in their vestibular function, their, their, uh, um, their balance function, the pain doesn't get through to them, the shouting doesn't get through to them, but you pick someone up and start shaking them up, that, that sensation of feeling like they're falling as we're lowering them to the floor will often, uh, or not often, but sometimes be enough to wake someone up as well. So just, just be aware that if you're lowering someone to the floor from a chair or doing something else to manipulate their balance, uh, uh, that can often be enough. Um, if people wake up in the middle of feeling like they're falling, very often they do that with a start, and they're very startled and very scared at first, especially if you're wearing a full face respirator and face shield. Um, so just be aware that that's something that might cause a, a rapid increase in level of consciousness. Um, so in terms of more things that are the same, biology and physiology, uh, hypoxia is bad, hypoxia is always bad. Hypercapnia and acidosis is also always bad. Um, Hypoxia, as you guys know, is lack of oxygen. Um, hypercapnia and acidosis. Hypercapnia is an increase in carbon dioxide and acidosis is the, the acidotic state or the lower pH state of the, the, the human physiology secondary to, in the, in the case we're talking about right now, to the hypercapnia. Um, it's important to recognize, and this is something that I see so, so, so many people do wrong in terms of overdose management, it's important to recognize that oxygenation is only one facet of the resuscitative process. Um, and so very often in, in harm reduction sites and very often in street environments, we'll see people, I think pulse oximeters are terrible for this because they've really convinced people that they can do this. Um, we'll see someone overdose and we'll see providers simply give that person oxygen, put a pulse oximeter on their finger and say, oh, look, their oxygen levels, at, 95% now, that's great. It's great, we've saved them. We can take all the time we want to give them oxygen and, and, and all this other stuff. And what they don't realize is that by just providing oxygen without actually providing ventilations as well, without providing that ventilatory support, you're not helping the body expel. Um, if that patient still has a very, very slow respiratory rate, you're not helping that patient expel their carbon dioxide and you're helping them become, or they are becoming more hypercaptic, more acidotic, which is causing damage to kidneys, which is causing damage to brain function. Um, so it's very, very important. Please follow your ABCs, airway first, then breathing, then circulation. Once you've got an airway in place for good management of your airway and you're ventilating your patient, you have all the time in the world to administer naloxone, but please don't skip the ventilatory step. Um, it, it's not good medicine, it's not good healthcare, it's not in the best interest of your patient to skip that ventilation. Um, wooden chest syndrome. Wooden chest syndrome is a, is a thing that, that does actually exist in an in-hospital environment as well. Uh, wooden chest syndrome is in some very few, but I have seen this a handful of times, uh, in, in very few, but a number of cases in which very, very high potency opiates have been administered or used by someone 
um, we can actually see uh, um, it's, it's almost a, a tonic stiffening of the chest wall, of the muscles of the chest wall, um, making a patient very, very difficult or impossible to ventilate with a bag valve mask or with other means because their chest wall, instead of becoming flaccid and apneic, they've become rigid and apneic. And that, of course, means that we don't have any way for the lungs to expand or contract and to move air in and out. Um, the wooden chest syndrome is a syndrome that was recognized uh, a long time ago in operating room uh, environments, uh, specifically with uh, the use of fentanyl as, as a sort of an um, anesthetic and or induction agent in, in, uh, in anesthesia in operating rooms. But it's something that with high potency or ultra high potency opiate and opiate analogs in the field, we do actually see in street environments now as well. Not often, but sometimes. Um, one of the ways to deal with that is to administer some, some IM naloxone um, almost as an airway or a breathing intervention. So if you're actually having trouble ventilating someone because their chest is rigid, some intramuscular naloxone or IV or whatever route you happen to be able to give it, the administration of some naloxone um, may help reduce that rigidity and allow you to ventilate your patient more effectively. Um, it's important to remember that some physiological responses are, are usual with drug use. Um, marijuana makes your heart go faster. Amphetamines make your heart go faster. Someone who uses uh, MDMA or cocaine and is then a little bit tachycardic, that's perfectly reasonable. Um, or not, could be perfectly reasonable. I should qualify that. Um, obviously more serious tachycardia is people get up in the 140s, 150s, 160s or higher. That's obviously problematic, but seeing someone with an elevated heart rate after using a stimulant drug uh, or after having some anxiety after a bit of marijuana overuse is another example that we see a lot. Um, or, uh, I'll, I'll leave it at that, um, it is not necessarily unusual. Doesn't mean it's not something you don't need to deal with, but it is, it is a predictable effect of some of the substance use. Um, other things to remember, non-drug emergencies happen too, so uh, marginalized groups for a whole bunch of really complex social reasons often have higher rates of chronic health conditions. Um, things that are overrepresented in marginalized groups, uh, and this, uh, this encompasses uh, people who are suffering from addiction, people from marginalized ethnic groups, people from marginalized socioeconomic groups, uh, all of these different, uh, different populations that, that may not have access to effective primary health care for a variety of really complicated reasons, uh, often have elevated rates of diabetes, hypertension, mental health concerns, cardiac issues, and any number of other challenges that, that, might, uh, that, that might be more easily managed if they weren't in a marginalized, uh, a marginalized system or a marginalized place. Um, but it's important to recognize that that means that what we may or and often do see higher rates of um, medical emergencies relating to these chronic conditions as well, also in, in harm reduction environments, right? Um, as an example, um, as an example, uh, uh, I'm thinking of, of uh, one individual I, I encountered in the last 10 years or so um, who uh, was a street living, uh, sleeping rough, not accessing shelters, not able to access shelters, uh, had a bunch of mental health concerns, type one diabetic. And this person literally was unable to, uh, unable to have access to a glucometer that they could care for and, or, and, and keep with them because they're uh, living on the street, their items were stolen very, very frequently. And this person was um, maybe not in a place where they were able to physically defend themselves a lot, so they couldn't keep a glucometer. They would show up at a pharmacy once a day to take their, uh, to have their insulin given to them on a daily basis. And they would literally just guess their insulin dose for the day based on what they kind of felt like. And that person had fairly frequent diabetic events, uh, diabetic related uh, endocrine events requiring medical intervention, um, not through any direct fault of their own, but because they were in a system where it was very difficult to access what a lot of, of, a lot of other folks would regard as really basic, simple healthcare. Um, we do also see people who are in marginalized groups uh, um, suffer from uh, suffer from cardiac issues a lot more. People who don't have access to, oh, my chest is hurting a little bit. Maybe they don't have access to go see a primary care physician as, as easily as uh, as uh, other people might. Um, we do see some, to a certain extent, uh, 
and I don't have this on this list. Uh, I should have, but I didn't, I didn't actually think to type it out earlier. Um, we do see some uh, types of non, uh, or of, uh, of medical events that are directly related to substance use. Uh, pericarditis is an obvious one. Infection of the, the lining of the heart is a very common or fairly common uh, side effect of or, or sequelae of intravenous drug use, especially with uh, unclean substances or unclean needles or just living in an unclean environment, not having great access to be able to sterilize injection sites and things like that, um, can lead to infections in the blood, which can lead to infections in the lining of the heart. Um, similarly, we see a lot of people with cellulitis, so uh, uh, just general inflammation, severe infection and inflammation of, of limbs, especially around infection sites. And we also see a lot of people with uh, abscessed wounds, where, uh, where wounds have become abscessed again because of lack of access to hygiene facilities, um, increased, uh, increased prevalence of skin breaks and skin tears, either from sometimes from injection drug use, oftentimes just as a side effect of sleeping rough on streets. Um, but these people uh, will often come in with, with frequently severe abscesses that, that really do need medical attention. And it's important to recognize that, that you know, so someone comes in with a, a, an abscess the size of uh, a Macintosh apple, um, th that that person is having a medical emergency and needs access to IV antibiotics. Um, Mike's saying endocarditis, sure. Pick, pick a carditis. Um, but, um, you know, it's, it's also important to recognize uh, infectious disease uh, is certainly much more prevalent in street level populations. People are very frequently uh, exhausted, don't have access to good rest facilities, don't have access to good places to sleep and, and, and have good access to nutrition, good access to basic health care, uh, basic uh, basic necessities of living and that can very often uh, very often make people much more predisposed to developing chronic respiratory ailments or acute on chronic respiratory ailments um, so we we, uh, we often see uh, you know year-round pneumonias that people have that have been treated a dozen times with antibiotics and are probably completely resistant to everything now or, or largely resistant to everything now um, yeah um, so going back to some of the opiate epidemic uh, statistics, and we've only got a few more slides here, and then we'll open, uh, go back and do questions, and then open up for more questions. Um, you know, this is the, uh, the the visits to overdose prevention service sites and supervised consumption sites, all of the harm reduction sites in British Columbia over the last two years. And as you guys can see, those visits were, you know, across the province. The top line is the provincial, uh, the provincial sum. So uh, um, the, the totals for the province. And you can see that until about uh, 2019, October or so, those visits were fairly steadily on the rise. The trend was generally uphill. And then starting in, uh, starting in December, there's a little bit of a dip. And we've traditionally seen dips in, uh, if you look at previous years and stuff, um, we've traditionally seen some dips around Christmas time and around that time of the year and stuff. And then there's this catastrophic drop between, uh, you know, really about February or so and uh, April. And we're seeing a slight uptick. So in, in, in October of 2019, we had 79,000 visits to supervised consumption sites. And as of June, we had 37,000, so under half. Um, that's very specifically and very directly uh, a result of, of COVID uh, and what COVID's done to the harm reduction infrastructure in this province. Um, and uh, I want to be very clear that I'm not in any way trying to criticize uh, the, the responses of, uh, of the harm reduction agencies, but it's, it's definitely interfered with people's ability to access uh, or willingness to access, uh, or it's interfered with people accessing um, harm reduction services. So what have we seen at the same, over the same period of time? Well, from the start of 2020, uh, these are the, uh, these are the, this is the uh, illicit drug overdose death rate as published by, I believe this is the BCCDC's number. You know, we see sometime in, in 2020, January, 
the numbers are on 1.5 deaths per 100,000, and that's increased uh, two and a half fold to 3.4 deaths. Um, I see someone, uh, Margaret, commenting, everyone's broke in February. I hate to say it, it's not, it doesn't have anything to do with people being broke. It's, it's that the site started to close down and that people started to be told to social distance, I think is, is a lot of it. Um, but, um, um, you know, we, we see this in, uh, uh, we see this in the, the CDC stats here is that we've seen a massive increase in the prevalence of uh, illicit drug overdose related deaths uh, over the last four or five months as well. So in terms of actual hard numbers, uh, we looked at these numbers earlier, but in May of 2019, I wanna drive this home for folks because I want people to understand this. In May of 2019, we're still doing poorly. We had 88 people die. So three people a day, every eight hours, someone dies from a, an illicit substance related death. In June of 2019, 76 people. So same thing, two or three people a day. In July, about the same. Two, two and a half, somewhere two and a half people a day in July. In May of 2020, we had 171 illicit substance use deaths. In June of 2020, we had 175. We don't have statistics for July yet. Um, I see a question from Mr. Me. I'm gonna come back to your question there. Um, this is maybe a, uh, um, um, this is a, uh, this is a coroner service, BC coroner service data table for the illicit toxicity deaths by month. Uh, I think Anna's slides had this earlier as well, but as you can see guys, uh, you know, in, in June of 2010, we had 21 substance use related deaths. In June of 2020, we had 175, um, at this time of year, to the end of June in 2010, we had 97 substance-related deaths in the province. Uh, by the end of June of 2020, we had 728. That's a that's a catastrophic and mind-blowing increase. Um, and as you can see as well, we were making some degree of progress from sort of our peak uh, in uh, 2017, uh, at least looking at the subtotal line there halfway through, and they're just above July, in between June and July. Um, you know, at, at the end of June uh, in 2017, we had 833. We're improving that somewhat in 2018. 2019 saw a fairly significant improvement down to 543. Still five and a half times higher than, uh, um, uh, five and a half times higher than a decade ago, but an improvement. And now we're, we're in 2020, we're back up to 728. And it's, uh, it's a pretty upsetting number to see. So why is this happening? Well, um, a whole bunch of reasons. Uh, a lot of, as a result of COVID, a lot of OPS and SCS sites have closed or operated at reduced capacity or with limited services. Uh, and I'm not here to talk about which ones have or haven't, or, or you know, I know there's varying degrees of opinions about uh, how much services should be reduced and, and all that. I'm not here to talk about any of those. Uh, at the end of the day, the fact is that a lot of the sites are running at limited capacity. Um, drug supply has been disrupted at the border. What that means is that uh, with it being a lot harder to get drugs, uh, people are either synthesizing things locally or cutting more into uh, into drugs to try and uh, to try and make them more potent and cut them down more, get more of a profit margin over what they do have access to. Um, a lot of social supports are eroded or gone. So uh, people who are maybe not uh, not, if you will, fully marginalized and, and really living in a high risk situation on the street, um, may not have access to a lot of social supports that they were leaning on as they were trying to get clean or trying to not use. Um, and a lot of other social pressures have increased, uh, have increased uh, pardon me. I think, uh, I think we've seen a lot, of, uh, a lot of people experience increased stress as a result of COVID uh, over the last uh, over the last uh, six months or eight months or so, God, it's been eight months now. Um, and uh, I think all of those things have contributed. There's probably a lot of other factors uh, um, that, that have contributed to this. This is not an area that I specialize in. Um, these are sort of the low hanging and obvious fruit that are being talked about a lot in, uh, in harm reduction communities as reasons, but there probably are others as well. Um, 
that's all we've got, folks. I'm going to leave a couple of sources up here. I'm just going to slide through a couple of slides here really fast um, to put uh, to put some of these sources up on the screen here. Um, I'm going to, uh, as we leave this here, I'm going to scroll back up to the top of some of the questions here. Um, so I see going back to, to 720 here, I see a comment from, uh, um, I see a comment from Thomas Finn. With consistent use, your brain actually decreases the amount of receptors available for activation the more you activate these pathways. This leads to tolerance in the way that eventually, in the way that eventually your brain needs a baseline amount of drug in order to even hit feeling normal. Without that baseline, you feel withdrawal. Uh, that, that's a fantastic summary, Thomas. I, 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 it's, uh, you said it better than I could myself. Um, uh, it, w w having had a number of conversations with people struggling with substance use disorder and addiction, um, people will tell you that when they first started, um, their first few hits or their first f few uses would give them a sense of euphoria and that over time that becomes just an attempt to be not in pain or not in withdrawal. And that's certainly consistent with everyone that I've talked to's experience. Um, uh, Thomas asks, has it been considered that one of the contributing factors to the decline is the increase in deaths uh, of the drug using population attributing to public health initiatives is correlation, not causation. If you kill 5,000 new drug users over three years, it means some rising deaths decline or see um, You're not wrong that correlation is not causation. That's actually one of my own mantras. I try, I try very hard to avoid that. Um, but when you look at supervised consumption site usage, for example, um, I, I don't think we've even come close to having had enough fatalities to, 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 uh, to see that impact in terms of the number of deaths also decreasing because there's not enough people left using drugs. Um, I, I, it's not an area of expertise of mine. I'd need to, to tease apart the numbers and I need a statistician to do that as well. But that I, I don't, my, my initial reaction is that that's probably not the root cause of this. Um, you know, tens to hundreds of thousands of British Columbians are, are substance users to some extent or another. And, uh, um, you know, unfortunately, and we have, uh, yeah, with, uh, with those numbers, I don't think that the mortality rate is, is uh, I don't think that the current death toll is part of the cause of the reduction of the ongoing death toll. Um, Mike says it brings to mind the question of incidents of new addiction. That's also, it, it brings to mind a lot of questions, uh, incidences of new addiction, um, you know, what the actual population numbers of people using substances in the province are doing. Is that population increasing or decreasing? Um, my, my understanding is that it's a fairly stable one, or a fairly stable population in terms of numbers, but again, outside, uh, outside my area of expertise. Um, Mike's ice water in the ear comment, I think that was your question uh, in regards to uh, vestibular stimulation. Um, it's funny because, uh, you know, I certainly know uh, of uh, at least a couple of folks back in the pod uh, at our place, uh, a lot of the, the clientele would, would be friends with each other and would know each other. And uh, there were certainly a couple of uh, jokesters who would, uh, if they saw their friend on the nod, would get some of the harm reduction water ampules and would drip water in their friend's ears to try and wake them up, uh, to irritate them and play a prank on them. Um, so it's, you're not actually that far off. Um, I see uh, from Mr. Me, so with the reduction of services, the deaths really have not been too overwhelming. Well, I mean, overwhelming is a strong word. Um, but, you know, I mean, we've seen a pretty significant increase in the number of deaths, uh, and keep in mind, this is the number of deaths, not the num not the morbidity numbers, not the injury numbers, not the overdose numbers. We didn't even talk about the overdose numbers tonight, um, uh, of, of overwhelming, of being overwhelming, you know, um, yeah. Uh, overwhelming is also a very strong word that, that means a lot of different things to a lot of different people, but it's a very strong word. Um, 
certainly there's been an uptick in the number of overdoses. I know off the top of my head, they don't have these numbers in front of me. We've seen record numbers of overdose responses in single days. We've seen record number of overdose responses in, in uh, given months since the opiate crisis began. So we're seeing the highest numbers of that stuff that we ever have. Um, you know, how you want to define overwhelming doesn't really change that we're seeing this stuff in higher numbers than, than we ever have before. Um, I see Anna says the number of deaths from opioid overdoses are at the highest level they've been since the public health emergency was declared. That was pretty overwhelming if you ask her, I agree entirely. Um, Mike Oskinson uh, asks, still not much COVID in the homeless community. Um, I, uh, I'm not gonna talk about that too much, Mike. To the best of our knowledge, it's not, uh, it's not something that has hit the homeless community hard yet. There's certainly still a great deal of concern that that is, uh, that, that is possible. But uh, you know, it, it has not been a very large, uh, hasn't been a thing that's impacted the homeless community very much yet. Um, that's the end of the questions that I see here. I, I see a thanks from Ken. You're welcome, Ken. I'm glad you uh, glad you enjoyed the presentation. Um, does anyone else have any questions or comments or queries uh, or things that they would like to ask or, or, or inter intercede with before we? Um, Current stats are, I see from Thomas Finn, current stats are 2% for the big five illicit drugs. I'm not quite sure what 2% is and what the big five illicit drugs are. In terms of estimates, 5,000 deaths is 0.1% of the population of BC, so all those 2% was opioids, 0.1 reduced the expected death rate by 5%. Um, you know, again, Thomas, I'm, I'm not an epidemiologist. That's certainly not what the epidemiologists at BCCDC are, uh, um, the, that's certainly not what the epidemiologists who are the subject that matter experts in this field are, are saying or talking about. Um, but, um, but uh, you know, I, I'm not able to speak to that with any degree of authority, unfortunately. Um, Margaret saying, uh, especially with hand sanitizer and mask prices sent through the roof, uh, it's expensive for the homeless and impossible not for homeless people. Absolutely, um, you know, uh, talking to folks, uh, talking to folks who are living on the street, um, you know, if people don't have access to things like a toilet and a sink, it's very difficult for them to wash their hands. If their things are getting stolen every day, it's very difficult for them to keep repurchasing hand sanitizer every day. Um, trying to get people who are struggling with complex uh, complex mental health challenges and who are also sleeping rough on the street to wear masks if they're going to go into a shelter is a very different difficult thing to accomplish. Um, again, multifactorial issues that 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 are very, very complicated, but uh, but it's a real problem for folks. absolutely. Um, any other questions, folk? Any other uh, any other questions, queries, comments? Give everyone a second here. I'm just going to uh, slide along our slides here a little bit. In, in your opinion, would you say the drugs of today are more potent or less potent than the drugs that were around back when I was growing up, the uh, 60s, 70s, where people were walking off a building? Because yeah, absolutely. That's a, that's a great question. That was a question from uh, uh, Gordon Goglia. Um, Gordon, I'm going to put you back on mute here just while I answer. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I think that, yeah, that it, absolutely they are. That's one of the things that we talked about when we talked uh, about the difference between what used to be sort of standard or common opiates like opium and actual organic heroin like grown from plants uh, versus, uh, versus fentanyl and carfentanil, the other fentanyl-like or opiate analogs now. Um, you know, fentanyl is an order of magnitude more potent, 10 times more potent than, than heroin. Um, carfentanil is another, I forget if it's 10 or 100, but a couple of orders of magnitude more potent again. So we're now looking at, at substances where, uh, you know, instead of measuring things in grams, you're measuring things in micrograms. Um, and, you know, the 
the difficulty in accurately measuring those things in micrograms is part of the problem as to why we're seeing uh, why we're seeing uh, people overdose more because the people who are doing this measuring they're not doing it in, in a pharmaceutical lab they're not doing it in a controlled environment um, they're doing it with whatever tools they have at hand uh, and we're seeing you know that imprecision reflected in overdose numbers to a certain extent and I see a thanks from uh, Andy and Shirley and Kamloops. You guys are welcome. It's always lovely to see you guys here. Um, I see thanks very much, Dave. Great briefing. I, I am actually Nick, but you're welcome. Uh, <laughs> um, I see Mr. Me saying a good argument for uh, for government supplied opioids. Um, it, it's funny you say that. Uh, so we do actually have a trial program here in British Columbia, and I, I'm not an expert on this by any stretch of the imagination, but uh, um, uh, we do actually have a, a couple of trials in different places around British Columbia where we are actually having the government provide uh, pharmaceutical grade, uh, uh, I believe it's just limited to opiates, but I'm not sure, please don't hold me to that. Um, to people who are deeply entrenched, uh, people suffering with, with long-term addiction issues, um, uh, uh, and uh, meet certain criteria for that, um, where we're, we're providing that as a harm reduction uh, uh, tool in a, a trial basis. Uh, I don't know too much information about that. Google and some news media articles are probably your, your best way to do some more research. I'm sorry, I wish I could talk with more... Uh, um, uh, uh, with more authority on that. Uh, Thomas says, well done, thanks. I've did methadone and Duncan quite regularly right at Cider Station. Absolutely. Methadone's been around for ages. I'm talking about people actually receiving uh, receiving medical grade, uh, medical grade heroin or medical grade opiates. Um, I see a couple of other things from folks. I'm glad you guys appreciated this. Uh, um, yeah, I wish I could talk. Uh, I wish I could talk with any more authority about that. It's it's a program that I'm aware exists, but uh, but I don't have details on it. I'm sorry. Um, I'm going to turn my camera off, guys. Uh, if there's any more uh, questions here, please do let me know. Um, we'll leave the chat open for just a couple more minutes in case there's any last minute questions come in. Um, and uh, I, uh, I look forward to seeing you guys hopefully next week. Uh, for uh, for whatever we still don't have anything booked, but we will uh, we will update with you guys uh, as soon as we do uh, as soon as we do actually have uh, a speaker confirmed.